Welcome to Rune Soup, a podcast about magic, culture, and the paranormal. Coming to you from... My name is Gordon, and I shall be your host. Enjoy. Today on Rune Soup, we speak to John Higgs, author of, among other titles, I Have America Surrounded, The Life of Timothy Leary, The KLF, Chaos, Magic, and the Band Who Burned a Million Pounds, and, most recently, Stranger Than We Can Imagine, Making Sense of the 20th Century. John Higgs, thank you very much for your time. Uh, Good to speak to you, Gordon. Yeah, do you know, I was thinking, and it's probably something that uh, I guess Greg from Daily Grail could answer, but it's almost, I think it's exactly a year or a year and a week since we were last hanging out in, in cold London. Yeah, it probably is something like that. The, it was the Daily Grail November, wasn't it? The Daily Grail website, though, completely skews all my my notions of time. I remember <laughs> that in, in the late nineties, uh, it was a sort of a daily place to visit in the late nineties, and all of a sudden, twenty years have disappeared. And I, I you know, I've, I've I've had a good time, but I haven't had twenty years worth of time in that period. Well, I mean, we're going to come on to uh, your book about the 20th century, but I think, I guess, thinking about time and its passage is uh, is something you do. Yes, that's a good place to start when it's 9 a.m. in the in the UK. You know? yeah. <laughs> I'm on my first of well, we actually we start with an easier question around here, which was, John, were you a weird kid? Um, as a kid, uh, I thought I was at the time. You know, at the time, I was the sort of little short kid who was into art and computers and and things like that. With hindsight, you know, with what with the, the what the late twentieth century was like, I think I was, I you know, I was pretty together. <laughs> I didn't know that at the time, but it all makes total sense to me now. I think uh, everyone, uh, everyone does think they're a little bit of an outsider in their awkward teenage years, because the reality is, you probably are compared to the rest of the yeah. universe as as that happens. Yeah, but, and the adult years as well. We're all, yeah. we're all <laughs> so, yeah, still trying to, still stuff. trying to get that, still trying to get it to work. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. but you know, all, all the all the things that were interesting to me then that were were um, you know not really reflected in uh, what society approved of. You know, were all all um, you know like science fiction and reading Douglas Adams and and learning how to program computers and and things like that these were all entirely legitimate you know things for a young child to spend his his thoughts on as far as it, as far as i can see now i get well they were new and with the maybe not Douglas Adams but it was a bit of an aberrant kind of way of thinking uh i mean were, were you interested in were you interested in counterculture for an early age because if you look at your um the sort of publishing history prior to the most recent book it's it's things like tim leary and so on so was that it has that been a lifelong interest that kind of uh alternative thinker type uh no i wouldn't i wouldn't consciously say it was it's just i don't seem to have that dividing line between what is culture and what is counterculture you know when i'm when I'm sitting down and, and uh, planning, say that book about the 20th century just started, I'm thinking, well, it needs, it needs Einstein and it needs Crowley, and you know, and, and that all just seems perfectly reasonable to me. I don't, I don't, um, you know, I'm, I've never really personally to label myself or define myself as counterculture. I've just, you know, I, I like it all. I like it all, good. Yeah, very good. It's, it's it's all it's all good. Um, but I mean, I was I, I grew up in North Wales, so it wasn't. Uh, you know the, the the you know the cutting edge of the avant garde by by quite some distance. It had um, for culture. It had a, a heavy metal club uh, called the Tivoli, the Buckley Tivoli, which weirdly uh, was on some sort of international uh, rock band touring circuit. So you get all these really incredible American rock bands, you know, turning up in the middle of nowhere in North Wales and sort of sort of looking outside the club in the day and just like looking terrified at where they were, <laughs> where they were. So that, that was culture for me was like heavy metal uh, because that's all, all there was around there. But it was when I got to Liverpool, then I started to hear about people like Robert Anton Wilson and, and, uh, and read more, more widely. So is that in college? Yeah. Yeah, it was. I went, I went to, um, it was only 23 miles away in fact, um, from where I was, but I went to Liverpool and, um, when I was 18. Yeah, that was great. That was a great five years. I really enjoyed that. So do you have a memory of the uh, the first book, the book that activated you? What was the thing that 
kind of made you think, oh, uh, oh, this, I, I, I'm quite into this stuff. The book that activated me. Was God, it like that's... Bob Wilson? Was, you know, was it Cosmic Trigger? I do, I do have a very, very clear memory of uh, reading Illuminatus in the, in the uh, early 90s, or at least trying to read Illuminatus. I don't think I got very far uh, on my first attempt. And what it was was, and it sounds ridiculous now, this just sounds ludicrous, but it, uh, the book at one point explained what the eye in the triangle symbol meant. And then a few pages or so many pages later, it gave a completely different uh, explanation of what the same symbol meant. And the notion that this symbol could have two different meanings was just shocking <laughs> at the time because you're just not brought up to think in that, in that way. You know, it was just uh, that's certainly not what you're taught at school. And that one, I, th- I think after I, that simple realisation was... Uh, what caused me to sort of put the book down and just sit there and, you know, absorb that. That was all I could handle at that point. <laughs> this is why no one finishes the Illuminatus trilogy on the, on the first round, because they'll, they'll find yeah. a thing that, they'll find a thing that trips them up and you go, Oh, I need to think about that. Yeah. <laughs> I, I need to process that for about 10 years and then I can <laughs> come back. <laughs> uh, it's, I mean, I, I kind of, uh, I have some sympathy with the journey because if when you find that stuff, if you if you grow up regionally and not in one of the sort of officially cool places in the world, uh, mm. you a book like that can be transformative and quite for me anyway. It was very intoxicating because you can you suddenly realise that there are people, there are thoughts you are allowed to think, and uh, and it, it's quite it's quite exciting the first time you encounter it. So there are books that are sort of burned into my journey uh, that are, mm. that are like that. Often it's it's a recognition. It's a recognition of thoughts that you've had, but you've not really been able to link them to anything else in the wider culture. You know, they're they're, they're not part of uh, of of what you've sort of grown up in. But once you read them, you go, "But yes, of course, no one's ever said that." But you know, I've thought that for so long. Yes, a process of remotely finding the others. Yeah, yeah. It it took a while i'm you know mid 40s now. <laughs> now now they're everywhere it's fantastic <laughs> i know it's good isn't it were you um was was the writing thing kind of the journey for you from from an early age did you was that what you were planning to do when you went to liverpool and um, attempted to read illuminatus i was uh you know as a kid i was i was the kid who drew you know that that was i was you know who drew weird things i was the one who was good at art that was uh you know what whatever substitutes for an identity you have that's that's who i was at school um and then i had a, a weird uh well i had a choice i could either go to art school or i could go to to liverpool to do a degree in computers and um it just felt that a degree in computers was 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 more interesting at that point you know it it, it, it was at that point computers were clearly a thing this was before um you know, there was a computer in every house. There was be- before we think of them as networked and, and connected sort of things. But it just it just seemed more relevant. So I, at that point, I thought I won't go to art school. I'll go and and learn about computers. And I stopped sort of drawing and painting around that time. But I started writing, um, and that seemed to suit my. You know, it's, it's a it's a it's a very very different skill. What I used to love about painting wasn't so much the painting it was the looking really really taught you how to see things you know really taught you how to look at things uh and um and it was a real it it made looking a a joy a simple joy it was it was it was it was great but um writing is very is much more i'm waving my arms about in a way you can't see but that's 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 completing my sentence that would have Uh, that makes complete sense writing is Writing is much more uh, 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 building a, a larger model to be of use for you, I think. Um, and that's really, I mean, it took me a long time to, to make the fool's leap to, to say, no, I am a writer now. Um, but that's really what I wanted to do from that point on. Would you, with a time machine, like it, with the benefit of hindsight, would you have told younger John to go to art school over computer school? Uh I generally wouldn't have changed anything. Um, p- probably for if I had a time machine, this is um, because I'm very, you know, where I am now works for me. It's just, uh, you know, I've got 
my kids are healthy. I've got two great kids and, uh, and uh, my house and my relationship and, and the place I'm in in Brighton and the people around me and what I'm doing in my daily work I wouldn't change a single part of this. Right. So I'd be I'd be terrified of, uh, you know, uh, uh, you know, making the butterfly flap its wings at any point in, in the past. Uh, that said, you know, the I do look at my 20s and go. Yeah, that was that was a bit of a waste, wasn't it? Really, yeah. my twenties, my, my, my thirties. I was raising my kids; they were young kids in the thirties, so that that feels that feels good. But there's very little I look back on in my twenties and go, "Well, I'm, you know, that was that was time well spent." See, I um, I resonate with what you're saying because I quite like how my life is going at the moment. Touch wood, but I did. Mm. Uh, I went. I did a film degree, uh, oh. and. In many respect, by the end of by sort of the third year, I was looking for more detailed business stuff. So I was doing all the production modules and trying to work out how to budget and so on. And it just wasn't there. It, it was essentially an art school. It's a communications degree, but it's just run by um, some crazy mid twentieth century Australian film community types. It was a wonderful time, but mm. I, I kind of wonder now: one, whether the uh, whether you could make the case for going to university, particularly if you, for American listeners where it's now prohibitively expensive uh, yeah, I, and, and the information I, is available otherwise. But I sometimes think, would I have been better off? Would I tell myself to go and do an economics degree and learn film and art and writing in my own time? And I, I'm kind of looking back. It would, it would have completely – it would mess with the timeline and one of the Star Trek ships would have to show up and kill me or, <laughs> or, or fix it. But I, I just look back over my own – educational choices and think i could have optimized that i i think there's a point um in most people's life when they realize that the only really worthwhile career would be a, a nurse or a doctor when you when you do go and you just help people all day and then that you know you would if you're working in an office or or one of these bullshit jobs or or, or service industry job and you just it's just not satisfying in any way you generally come to the conclusion that yeah i should have been a doctor or a nurse or, or something of that ilk and if we all knew that then everybody would be doctors and nurses and you know the 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 rest of culture would just be this wasteland so it's probably healthy that we all make horrible mistakes and uh and and find our own strange snaking path through it um uh, just just thinking back to what you were saying about was there a book that that, that you know awakened you or whatever your your phrase was I, I recall when i finished my degree i did this degree in in uh in computers in liverpool and i went to work for a company called gc marconi secure systems in in wavertree in liverpool um i was a, i was a configuration engineer on when a, on was a, this on a, uh, this was be 90 three something of that ilk interesting uh, yeah you know the I'm, company comes up in uh, in some interesting stories to do with mysterious uh, scientist deaths later on oh that i didn't know yeah that, yeah, yeah so uh, the kind of cluster of it's it's one of those uh I've, if you're familiar with nick redfern uh he's written books about it as well but the kind of scientists who are involved in those sort of projects that bump up against the deep state there was a kind of cluster of mysterious suicides and deaths and there were some marconi ones that's why i was trying to work out when you were there to either accuse you of it or say congratulations yeah. <laughs> you know you got out before that happened yeah well it was this this particular branch of gc gc marconi made um encryption devices for the military so it was all, you know, see what um, I mean, you know, yeah, maybe yeah, it I, was find you. Special <laughs> I find the special secrets act and things like that. And I, I took great delight in photocopying documents that, that were classified and you know, put them on my wall at home, even though they are literally things about, you know, the specifications for how you glue on a label on a chip, and <laughs> like the most meaningless, meaningless things. But it was there, the, my, the, the boss I had, um, I was just a regular 50 year old scouse guy. Uh, just one day, just brought in a copy of Siddhartha and goes, I think you'd like this. And gives me this copy of Herman Hesse's Siddhartha. And it's, doesn't, it doesn't connect that that book would appear in such a world. It makes no real sort of sense to me that um, it, it, was, it was just culturally weird, you know. Uh, and, uh, and that was a big influence on me, definitely reading that. Um, uh, and that led on to uh, things like Dao De Jing. Someone gave me the Dao De Jing after that. So those are all very, very important books. I've sort of leapt back in time 
uh, with my time machine to answer a question from about 10 minutes ago. No, it's good. It's <laughs> oh, good. I, I, uh, it's because when you say it, it seems like it would be out of context in Marconi. I mean, you were a former employee, but uh, there is some valid speculation to do with how parts of the deep state operate that ha- they're, they're in that sort of plug in through the back door of the office rather than the front where that kind of information would in fact be. Um, not out of place, but interesting. It's it's mm-hmm. it's funny where these things uh, show up, and it's it is a counterculture classic. Uh, so I- even if there's a blurred distinction between culture and culture and counterculture, it's interesting that that one showed up. So how do you get from being mm-hmm. a Marconi employee to writing your first book? The Tim Leary book was the first, was it? Yeah, that was ten years ago. Um, that was. Well, I I, um, I did that job for about eighteen months, and I just thought, hey, hang on, this is this is not me in the slightest. So I I, um, I just quit upon me, and that's one of the two times in my life I've quit a job, and every time it's just been the best decision you could you could possibly make. And it always is, why didn't I do it earlier? That's that's my advice on people thinking of quitting a job. Um, uh, and then I was unemployed for about six months, and then I got a job as a runner on a TV program called The Big Breakfast, and I moved down to London, and I spent my 20s working in um, in rubbish television. Um, and, and I did a lot of programs about video games, um, and then I... Uh, and what did I do then? Yes, there's lots of video game journalism and video games, television, uh, and a bit of animation. And I, and I worked in a video games company producing uh, driving games. Um, uh, but at that at that point, I'd got to know a guy called Brian Barrett, um, who figures in my uh, Timothy Leary book quite quite heavily. Uh, he was this old sort of beat writer. He was just well, he was just an amazing guy. He was he was pan, you know, he was pan incarnate. He was just this gleam in his eyes. He was just this uh, this. This, he was this woodland spirit of a man. He was just fantastic. And we go 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 around his place in uh, South London, and um, he'd just tell us all these stories about when he's on the run with Timothy Leary and Algiers with the Black Panthers and in, in Switzerland with you know all these arms dealers and um, and you just listen to these stories and go wow these these are fantastic you know so someone really should write a book about this someone really has to write a book about this and and when you'd see mentions of tim leary you know online or or you'd read it you go oh yeah that's not kind of right is it because the context has been lost you know it's just you know god someone really needs to clear all this up and then after a few years of that it's just like Oh, it's me. <laughs> oh, it's I'm the one who's supposed to write the book. Oh, God, I've just been so slow. And I think Rosemary Leary died around that time, and there was a there was a sense that um, someone didn't write this book soon. You know, all these people wouldn't be around with us anymore. So um, it was like, oh, God, I'm going to have to quit my job. Uh, actually, it, it seems odd to thinking back to it, because I just had our second kid, and... Uh, quitting your job to go off and write a book about timothy leary in those circumstances you know when you got a mortgage and all these sort of things uh, it's 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 not the most rational of, <laughs> of, of of choices i think i was i was quite ignorant about uh how, how financially how, how publishing worked so i just thought oh, i'll write a book and that'll be fine um uh so that was yeah that became my first book that was um that was a real experience that was a real because i've never really written anything before and so, you, from uh, memory because I, I um i should have got it out before it's in the garage because obviously the move um ooh. you I, you went off to the states to talk to people didn't you was that that one yeah that's right i went um there's a woman called uh, uh dennis berry who was in in charge of of, of of the Timothy Leary estate at the time, all his, you know, he's a real hoarder. You know, he knew he was, he knew his, his future people would want to look through his stuff. He collected it all, and it was at that point it was in a lockup garage um, just outside of Santa Cruz in, in the mountains uh, in Northern California. Now it's all with the New York Public Library, and it's all being digitized and searchable, and it's all available for everything. So I went over there because she let me sort of rummage. You know, uh, I spent a week in there just reading everything and photographing things and you know she and that's she introduced me to robert anton wilson and 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 various people and uh uh michael horowitz was a massive help as well he was louis archivist and they were just really um there, there were there was some lovely people around him 
you know you, you just turn up and you go you don't know me i'm i'm from a, a country in europe I, I just want to look at all this stuff and they they take you into their homes and they just uh, um and they just help me in every way so sort i'll of never really forget that did you get a chance to ask bob wilson which of the eye in the triangle descriptions was the correct one <laughs> no that, that didn't come up um uh i did get to ask him you know, a, a few years later, he was, he was getting quite ill at that point. He was getting quite frail uh, and his voice was very sort of quiet. And um, but as normal, you know, you'd, you'd think, oh, I've got all these things to ask. And you'd, you'd uh, start a conversation and then suddenly the conversation would veer into the most strangest ways. And at the end of the evening, you'd go, oh, that was really good. But, uh, I, you know, no, most of it was of no use to the uh, the book I'm writing, but we had this really good discussion on which rivers were masculine and, and, and things like that. Well, that would have been, I mean, that would have been quite a trip. It, it, did you, we had the uh, Bob Wilson meeting, was that arranged before you got over there? Or was that one of the kind of happy uh, things no, no, that no, ha- no. goes along with, you know, you write a book and, and the universe tends to sort of rearrange itself around you? It's exactly that. It's exactly that. It was one of my first experiences of that. I, n- I now know to trust that much more. Um, you know, you just start doing something. You, you, know, you can't sort of plan when you're deciding whether to do something. You can't plan it out at all. You just have to make the decision if it's something you want to do, and then you start doing it. And then it all, then as you say, the universe uh, rearranges itself. Um, but it was. Uh, well, yeah, was describe great. that. Describe the first meeting because that would have been. He's obviously hugely popular with listeners to the podcast. Uh, mm. And I'm sure there are people out there who would have been jealous of the opportunity to talk to him. But that it must have been kind of like some butterflies. What was it like? Yeah, very, mu- very much so. Because it was just. Oh, my memory is, uh, uh, I think it was just arranged the day before or something. It wasn't a planned thing. Um, and. Um, all this time, you know, because I've never written anything before, I'm trying, trying to present myself as someone who knows what they're doing. You know, it's that thing about, you know, we're always a fraud. You know, I was totally a fraud at that point. You know, I really didn't know how to string a sentence together. And, you know, I had to learn how to write <laughs> coherent sentences because I had not done anything before. And for your first major attempt at a writing project, uh, a biography of someone as complicated as Timothy Leary is kind of in at the deep end uh, to the extent that now, if I was thinking, oh, should I write a biography of Timothy Leary? I'd go, God, that'd be a tricky one. Yeah, that'd be, <laughs> that'd be a challenge. But because I was so clueless, I just did it. And, that, that's, uh, uh, and that's always the way. That's very much the Ken Campbell uh, approach. So I was thinking, oh, God, he's going to, you know, Bob Wilson in my brain was like the smartest guy in the room. He was, he was, if anyone was going to see through me, it was going to be him. You know, I just, as I go there and he'd just see me for the fraud I was. Uh, and I went there uh, and I said, hello. And he saw me for the fraud I was, and he smiled and he welcomed me. And it was just wonderful. <laughs> and it was, it was, yeah, it was, it was very, um, I, th- I think what it brought home to me was, um, You'd never hear anyone who knew him with a bad word to say about him, at least not seriously, you know. You know, obviously maybe there'll be people who accuse him of being CIA or or, or whatever. But um many of the uh the, the the greats or the or the people who change things for people, you know, the people who who show you a new way of living, as it were. Um are arseholes okay they're, they're terrible to their wives they're, they're you know they're they're so driven and, and things like that they're they're bad bad people and uh, elon musk is, is is a really interesting example i've got very fascinated by elon musk at the moment and uh, i think what he's doing is so important but you know i just hate to work for a guy like that it's just a, but to see that robert anton wilson was genuinely a compassionate empathetic um lovely human being uh was kind of an important thing that thought yeah that's the sort of that's the sort of hero we need to raise up you know if we, if we are looking to these people for a better way to to live surely at some point you know they should stop being assholes <laughs> well it's, <laughs> so, it's it's keenly observed i mean people can um 
respond to or criticize parts of his ideas, but no one, he, he mm. doesn't get the, you're right, he doesn't get the, the Crowley treatment, which is like, this person was a monster. He was a terrible person. Yeah. Uh, yeah. We, we read his stuff regardless, but he was terrible. Uh, no yeah. one, no one's ever said that about Bob Wilson. Yeah. And it's, I mean, he's an interesting contrast with uh, the, the beat writer, Brian Barrett, I mentioned earlier. There's a bit in Cosmic Trigger where uh, Leary meets uh, Wilson, or well, Wilson goes to meet Leary in prison, and Leary's going, you've got to meet uh, Brian Barrett. You're, almost, you're, you're two people looking at the same subject from different angles. He's much more an artist. You're much more from a sciencey sort of background. Um, so you, you've got to meet and sort of compare maps and, and, and things like that. And the two men really reminded me of each other in their sense of humour, in... Um, Oh, hundreds of personal ways, except that uh, Wilson was um, frail. You know, he did have polio, he had post-polio syndrome. You know, his, his health had been awful for so much of his life. And he'd become very compassionate, very Buddhist, very Taoist, um, whereas Brian was indestructible. In one of Leary's books, um, He's introduced with the sentence, uh, he, Brian is not going to die. They will have to kill him. He's, he's, uh, <laughs> he, he's, he's just this toxic blast uh, contaminating the middle classes completely. He's, he's, just, he's just pan. He's just the life spirit. He's just vibrant. He's just lustful. I wrote a, um, a bit for me for the independent newspaper, and I was able to get the word uh, lustful in the first sentence of an obituary. And I, was very, I knew he'd like <laughs> I knew yeah. he'd like um, so they're, they're very much similar, but because uh, one had so much health and, and, uh, and one was so frail, you know, one was much more sort of compassionate and one was much more sort of mischievous and, and, and spiky. Um, very, very, but other than that, very similar people. So, um, how, how, I mean, let's get, describe Tim Leary to us and, and sort of why, for people who, who are unaware, like why would, why is that someone people need to know about? Uh, and and also, in the process of doing so, I presume at some stage he started to kind of emerge from from the, the gloom of research into a, a concept you could get your head around. Because he kind of sits in between. He wasn't a saint, right? Um, mm. So he wasn't at the Bob Wilson side of things, but uh, he certainly yeah, wasn't I mean, at the Bob Crowley end of the spectrum. But he, he's a person who did institute or you know bring about cultural change. Uh, to and was complicated massive, to a massive, massive degree. To to the extent that I don't think we can imagine what our culture would be like if I hadn't been a, a Timothy Leary. The the that role of um, pushing psychedelics into the nineteen sixties is um, it's kind it's kind of unprecedented in uh, historically. You know, it's psychedelics is not. Uh, an easy sell you know it's not like a, a a drug like um oh i don't know alcohol or cocaine or marijuana which you, you can go oh you might like these you'll feel good you know yeah these massive 60s doses of uh of lsd well you know uh life and death and resurrection rituals for um the uni initiated you know it was this was a traumatic traumatic thing but certainly here in, i'm talking in the west particularly um you know we, there was no cultural framing of things like that as something positive you know if you look at um oh i'm, I'm thinking in was it andy lecter's book shroom there's a good book shroom mm -hmm. where he talks about all the accounts of uh psychedelic mushroom use in britain i think it was britain um all the accounts of them uh, are negative historically historic accounts i'm talking about you know someone in the 17th century has accidentally eaten something went out picking and they all think oh i'm dying i'm being possessed by the devil demons have got me you know they're they're, they're in the western culture all these things were seen as um uh horrible absolutely horrible you know it was leary with his his harvard um respectability at least at the start uh who who put this frame around these these things as hey no these are positive um that was very very new that was very very new and uh certainly if you if you as i did you, you go through all the 60s and you start to look for uh stories about uh 
psychedelics appearing um it's always leary pushing it it's you know he was very much the, the man at the forefront i mean you can argue uh, as i would that ken casey probably did more to spread the use of them uh certainly in in, in california but it, he would always you know respectfully demur to leary as, as as the sort of the sort of guy and the amount of um change uh, that that uh, issued in uh is just I mean, it's hard for us to get our head around. It's, it's so big and it's so wide. Obviously, obviously, culturally, musically, you can see the change in in people like you know, a Bob Dylan before and after Acid, in in Brian Wilson and in in the Beatles. You know, it's these were people who, who learned their craft and were brilliant. And uh, at a particular, you know, at folk, folk music or surf music or beat music, and then they took psychedelics. And then you get your pet sounds, then you get your Sergeant Pepper, then you get the major sort of sort of breakthroughs. Um, but it's uh, if you look at things like uh, the growth of the uh, PC industry of, of, of home computers, it's it's kind of a shock to realise the reason why Silicon Valley is where it is is because that was the heartland of the, the psychedelic counterculture. You know, you know, there's obviously famous quotes from uh, Steve Jobs about how taking LSD is one of the one of the f- one or two f- most important things in his life you can just see the influence you know uh, going through the, the notion that uh, hey wouldn't it be nice if we all had a computer in our homes you know that really wasn't coming from ibm you know that was coming from you know young acid heads in, in their garages you know building things although you know they, these are just a few of the examples you can look at environmental movement um uh, there's, 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 there's a lot of science that you can see is inspired by that. You know, this 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 wave of um, of, of psychedelic use in the '60s really changed changed things, really changed things massively. And and that's why, to finally answer your question, you know, I think that's why I think we need to get our heads around Leary a bit more, at least to understand how that came about. And let's look at, I agree completely, but let's look at some of the uh, shortcomings as well of, of Leary as a person, because he, you know, he did end up in prison and it has subsequently re- emerged that, you know, he had an FBI handler and and that kind of thing, which muddies it less than people think, but maybe um, uh, maybe more than a uh, purist would like, if, if that makes sense. Because if you're dealing with that kind of stuff, he was legally allowed to manufacture LSD, uh, some of it he got directly from, you know, uh, federal chemical agency things. So there, there are parts of it. There are the other parts of the the Leary story that end up with him, as you kind of mentioned at the beginning. There in Switzerland for a while, uh, not not mm. necessarily where where he would choose. It's it's a very no, he's very very much an exile. Um, you know, obviously you're right. There's there's, there's um, uh dark shadows o- over the man he's certainly um you wouldn't you know portray him as a, a, a saint or anything well some people would but he's, he's either a saint or a demon to people he's obviously the truth is somewhere in between he's obviously a multifaceted person i kind of think that's less important though than his influence i kind of think that um you know if if a, if a person uh, does something really immense uh that our tendency to say, God, I, you know, that person's got a wonky nose. Yes, but they've just saved these people from the fire. Yeah, but I don't like their head. We have this really weird fixation on, you know, if someone can produce uh, with their life's work uh, a major change uh, in our society um, to go, yeah, but, you know, they they were a rubbish parent. It's, it's, it's yes, they were. You, you know, you're quite right. But you're kind of... Uh, deliberately almost not looking at what's important about them you know there's that uh, uh, i think i think what's important about them is much more relevant you know it's no news that so you know some people are, are, are terrible parents there's a lot of terrible parents um that's not the reason that we're talking about leary if you know what i mean no absolutely i'm separating the impact out from the person is is certainly is certainly the way to go i'm not sure if that's quite um, I'm not sure if that's quite the end of it because he had federal permission to essentially dispense hallucinogens during the Cold War to American college students at a time where we since found out post church committee that these things that you you had the sort of deep dark corners of of uh, of Washington doing these clandestine experiments. So I, I for me it's more about 
getting a picture. I think, I think experiment is the key word there. Oh, yeah. I think it's hard to look back with what we know about psychedelics now and realize just how in the dark these people were. Uh, it's, it's certainly true that the you know the American uh, military and intelligence people were going. God, I wonder what, what, what this what, did, what does this drug do? Is this any use to us? We should just understand this. Was, that's definitely true. That was definitely happening. But um, they were so clueless. You know, they really had no idea what you know. Is it a truth drug? Is it not a truth drug? Is it? Could it be used in interrogation? Will it make people lie? They just you know it was it was such a trickster chemical. Whenever they thought they got their their uh got their head around what it did they realized we're totally wrong it was it would be you know it was doing something like that the fact that it was so subjective they didn't understand the fact that if yeah you know you gave the drug in in one of their military uh you know white coated labs uh, and people would be terrified uh, they just assumed it made people terrified they didn't understand the set and setting it's, it's from leary we get things like the, the importance of set and setting and uh and uh, that's you know one of those key insights into um into our understanding that we just take on board now because that's that seems that seem that seems to be understood but um well it's certainly- now we know what it for, sorry, sorry, Gordon. Yeah, well, we, we'll come on to the 20th century book uh, after the intervening one, but there's, it's certainly not a reason to uh, to avoid him. The reality is a lot of what happened in the 20th century was a side effect of NATO trying to beat those damn Soviets. Uh, we got space programs from it. We got, uh, you know, LSD and cultural settings from it. And these are, so, mm. some of them are, deri- you know, deliberate plans. We, we kind of know that from things like media manipulation. But the other parts of it are, side effects about what goes on when you give an intelligence apparatus unlimited money for 60 years. Uh, They do end up doing things. They do end up doing things like, well, we need more information about how LSD works. So let's give, (laughs) let's give like millions of doses out. (laughs) And uh, and that was kind of what was in play. I mean, I heard that the, this that was the logic behind Tor, behind the onion routers, you know, the, the, the dark net um, was, um, I don't have, I have to double check that this is entirely sure, but I'm sure it came from Jamie Bartler who wrote that book, the dark, the dark web or the dark net, which is a, is a great book, but they sort of wanted a way there for, um, in, you know, informants in other, in other countries or, or, um, uh, uh, dissidents in other countries to be able to communicate securely so they sort of invented this entire uh, opaque way of communicating on the internet uh, just for that and of course all of a sudden all the you know the drug dealers the terrorists the pedophiles and everything oh fantastic we have <laughs> we have the dark net now we can communicate like this it's just these unex- unexpected um uh you know uh, history is an emergent property you know we never yes. you know quite know what our the result of our actions will be we the uh, the uh, when the people at arpa were just trying to work out how to communicate um in a non distribute in a distributed way you know they they never really could imagine that in in a, in a in a generation or so that the algorithms of social networks would be creating uh countries that were so divided that the two sides had no way of grasping how the others were thinking you know we just we can never see the um uh the, the results of our of our of what we do no, and, and exactly. you know yeah, and and in a funny way, the twenty uh, twenty sixteen or the twenty first century has a lot of inertia from s- the sort of mental architecture of the twentieth century. There's on uh, mm-hmm. it's through a friend of mine, um, Jay, but there's a uh, a sort of image or graph of um, all the components of an iPhone, and there isn't a single piece of the iPhone that didn't come from the classified projects world originally. So, oh, that's, so here yeah. we are in in 2016. I mean, they, they're still surveillance devices. We we now know that, but uh, here mm. we are in 2016, <laughs> and and the sort of ubiquitous smartphone is entirely the result of uh, funding in into classified projects. So it certainly doesn't, you know. Uh, Tim Leary never stood alone in in kind of just being caught up in the wake of of you know a fifty year spy game. It, it, it's happened to everything, and and if people <laughs> people who who want to avoid him for that reason have to throw out their iPhone, as far as I'm concerned. <laughs> yes, there's no purity here. No. <laughs> ah, well, 
That's a that's a weird segue. Um, that's a weird segue into book number two because this is Rune Soup is obviously a chaos magic block. So mm. there is a second book. Uh, there is a second book which is about uh, chaos magicians and magic and 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 famously, uh, you know, the burning of a not small sum of money. Uh, yeah, and I mean, how did that one? How do we go? We'll move along from there. So, uh, Timothy Leary book came out. Was it in, funny yeah, enough, in yeah. unintended consequences? Was it the wake of that book that led to the KLF thing? Uh, on, on a small level, I mean, I, um, after I wrote that book, that came out about 2006, um, I did think, I did talk to the publisher about doing a book about the KLF, and uh, they were initially, oh, yeah, well, that sounds really good. We should, we'll do that. We'll do that. And I thought, right, I'll go away and, and start working on that. And, uh, and then the the publisher would, had ran into massive uh, financial difficulties and was sort of sold and all that. And the whole thing sort of fell apart. So it was it was shelved. And you know, I had I had to I had to earn money. So I sort of went back to proper work. And I didn't really view myself as a, as a writer at that point. I would sort of you know sometimes I'd be introduced as a writer and I go, no, no, I, you know, I make, I make cartoons for, for, for babies. <laughs> so I, Cause that's what I was paid to do. You know, that, that seemed more, more valid. It was only after I turned 40. Um, and I remember distinctly cause we went to Port Marion, you know, where the prisoner was filmed in, in North oh, Wales. It's one of my favorite places on the planet. I love Port Marion. And, uh, if you go and stay there, you know, in the, um, in the village you know it's there's tourists going around in the day but in the evening they all clear off and it's all lit up amazingly you can just wander around and explore it and it's just fantastic um and that's when i'd sort of reached the point where you know i knew enough about publishing to know that financially it wasn't possible to make a living as a writer if you didn't have, you know, um, a private income or a, uh, a very well-paid academic job that gave you loads of time off or um, your own BBC One television show, which gave you a massive sort of, uh, you know, I, I knew it didn't sort of work, but I also knew I had to do it at that point because it's sort of been building up and building up within me. And that's, that's the point I made the decision to make. It was a real leap of faith. It was like, no, I will stop doing these cartoons uh, and I will write or write books. That's what I'll do. Yes, I'll never forgive myself. You know, if I don't do this, uh, I'll be bitter. If I do it, I'll be penniless. Penniless is better than bitter. So I'm going to make that that leap. And um, I wrote two books very, very quickly at the same time. One just was a, a novel. There, cause suddenly, it suddenly occurred to me, I'm actually looking at the back of um, Stranger Than We Can Imagine right now as we're talking. And um, there's an Alan Moore blurb at the top. He turned 40 yeah. and decided to become a magician. You turned 40 and decided to become a writer. So you both had some kind of 40-itis. And uh, I just thought that's kind of, that's interesting that it was at that, that, that 4-0. And you go, look, I have to do this. This is what I declare. <laughs> The midlife crisis gets such a bad rep, but it's such a gift. It's a re- it's a real gift. The midlife crisis, just to go, oh, I'm, I'm having a midlife crisis, so I'm just going to pick up my life and wrench out this rut and put it over there. And it's you know, it's fantastic. <laughs> you know, I mean, admittedly, if you don't, if if your imagination link, links you to, uh, I'll get I'll get a sports car and a mistress. You know, then that's that's not so good. But you no, know, if no, you can no. do writer music, or magician music is better. Now, yeah, writer or yeah, magician yeah. is a better midlife crisis. I mean, they're both well, they're I mean, as financially disastrous as as getting the mistress and the sports car. But you know, <laughs> yeah. And if you'd have told me at the time that there would be Alan Moore right writing the blurb on my book, you know, that would have been uh, an act that no magician could have ever pulled off. You know, that was it was just unthinkable that. I would, I would know the people I know now. You know, it was just amazing. Um, oh, was that? So, did he? Did you attract his attention with the KLF book or the Tim Leary book? No, it's the KLF book. It was okay. um, well. In fact, okay, uh, just slightly jumping ahead, but after I did the KLF book, I did a, uh, a, a short novel called uh, "The First Church on the Moon," uh, which is probably my favourite book and probably uh, the least successful in that no one ever mentions it, no one ever talks to me about it. You know, it's not; it never comes up. Um, and uh, I, I, I really loved it. I would write stuff like that forever. It was it was much more it was much more uh, of a comedy. And I strongly suspect my sense of humour is just doesn't translate, you know, to a wide, <laughs> a wide scale. Uh, and that's that's the big flaw in trying to write comedy. But it was set in the Steve Moore moon base, um, which is just a little 
all the time I was writing it was set in the Shackleton moon base, which is in the Shackleton crater in the South Pole of the moon. And just before I finished, um, I'd read Somnium, Steve Moore's novel Somnium, Steve Moore um, being a, a writer who was essentially a guy who was in love with the moon. But he was also massively overshadowed by his friend Alan Moore. Uh, to the extent that he would always be Steve Moore, no relation whenever he was sort of sort of mentioned. Um, and I kind of thought, had this notion that in the future, yes, Alan Moore would, you know, be a known name and bit, but a complicated idea that would be studied at university, all the various facets of him, it would be a complicated thing. Whereas Steve Moore was just this much simpler idea. He was the guy who was in love with the moon. You know, he, his story would be told in, in nursery rhymes and, and, and things like that. And everyone would know the name, but not, not a huge amount much about him. So I figured that in the 22nd century, if you're going to name a moon base, it would be the Steve Moore moon base. And, um, it was a really indulgent little joke. I kind of figured maybe five people would ever go, ah, Steve Moore Moonbase, that's kind of nice. Um, but fortunately, one of those was uh, a guy called Alistair Fruish, uh, who's a Northampton writer. He works in prisons. Um, he's written this amazing book called The Sentence. Uh, he was... Um, he was Googling Robert Anton Wilson, actually, and it was just after me and uh, Daisy Campbell had, had done our first going out into public to talk about Robert Anton Wilson thing, which was a, a night in London at an uh, event called the Horse Hospital, which someone had filmed and put online. And he found me talking about Robert Anton Wilson and goes, oh, I wonder who this guy is, and Googled me and saw that I'd written this book set on the Steve Moore moon base. He was a friend of Steve Moore. He thought this was hilarious. He got the book. He gave it to Steve. Uh, Steve loved it uh, and he got in touch. And so it was through Steve Moore that I got to know Alan Moore. But from through once Steve I got to know Steve Moore, no relation, brilliant. Through Steve Moore, no relation. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, he says in his philosophy, to have a fictional moon base named after him is a greater honour than to have a real moon base named after him. <laughs> <laughs> like, <laughs> which I, which I like. He's no longer with us, sadly, Steve. No. He died there not so long ago. And he said he's sort of he's 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 also in my next book but as as a as an absence uh, very much um so it's all all these you know the 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 routes to who you get to know are so uh, mm. unpredictable it's always the act of just doing something and and, and the the you know uh, you'll have no idea uh, what changes it will bring to your life but you know by doing things things happen you know it's a it's, well, now it sounds like you became the magician at forty rather than writer. That's because I agree completely. But I get to I get to be both. I get to self identify. Yes. both. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, the kids, the KLF book has had this um, extraordinary impact. Or at least, so it, from my perspective, you know, from from from, from where I'm sitting. Um, the impact of that book just looks incredible, you know. And I know full well that the things I'm ascribing to it, uh, uh, it's just it's just what i'm focusing on and all the basically there's this there's this sort of um i don't even know how to describe it really in fact there's this 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 network of people over here in the uk um who all have sort of come together and there's this virtuous circle where we're all inspiring each other uh by being inspired it's 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 um it's it's a, Daisy Campbell, who I mentioned, who put on this play, The Cosmic Trigger, would define the others festival in Liverpool. Was there's all these these Cosmic Trigger people, and then in Northampton, there's all these uh, Northampton Arts Lab people, and then up in Liverpool and, and around Liverpool, Chester, uh, the Wirral, there's there's the super weird uh, happening, super weird record label of Greg Wilson, Kermit uh, Leverage. There's there's the Festival Twenty Three people in Sheffield. There's the people at the Cube in Bristol. There's, there's all these these. Um, folk who we all seem to have a sense that we're all part of something that something's happening to us and as long as we're not so stupid as trying to label the damn thing <laughs> it, it'll it'll keep keep sort of going and it to me it all feels um the logical extension of alan moore's uh fossil angels mm. uh essay if you're familiar with fossil i'm sure yeah, you are, yeah. yeah um which was which was a real um uh, yeah, that was a real important uh, uh, piece for me. Certainly, it, it, it certainly made because you know I've known uh, magical people most of my life. At most points, there's been at least one person in my circle who was um, I don't know whether Wiccan or, or Druid or or 
psychedelic like Brian or, or something like that. I've always got on with them. I always sort of uh, uh, enjoyed, enjoyed their company very, very much. Um, but I always saw magic itself as essentially Thatcherite, as essentially what I'm in it for, what I want. You know, mm-hmm. I want, I want, I want. That's how I saw, that's sort of, well, you know, how fair that was is I don't know, but I sort of grew up in the 80s, 90s. Yeah, you know, the, the it's, kept, it's, sort of it's, it's, you can, you can certainly make and defend that case, put it that way. Yeah. Yeah, um, and as I say, probably because I, you know, read a lot of Taoism and, and things like that, and the, the sense of just letting on things on furl makes a lot more sense than ramming a spanner in and and, and, and you know trying to get some money for yourself. Um, and um, so it wasn't until I read Fossil Angels, which goes, well, what's the point of this? What's the point of of magic? And and then arguing that it's you know it's it's it should be art. It should be um, like Austin Spare, the artwork that Austin Spare tells you far more about his brilliance as a magician than you know uh any any sort of you know personal experience that he had that, that it would produce something that it would share that it would it would contribute it would be able to point at things and say look we did that you know that's the uh that was a real key thing for me that was a real sort of uh, uh important factor um so I had you no read doubt, that had you read the Fossil Angels essay prior to the KLF? Because we should get back to that for people who don't know, um, basically who were the KLF, and why did you think oh, there's a book in this? Yeah, well, the K- the KLF were a, a late eighties, early nineties uh, UK uh, rave duo, essentially, um, who were massive. Who were you know, the nineteen ninety one, they were the biggest selling singles band in the world. But who were weird? Who were strange? They, they, I mean, they're originally called the Justified Ancients of Moo Moo. And, you know, when that comes on the radio, you don't hear words like justified or ancient, you know, on, on Radio 1 or whatever sort of pop station you listen to. There was, there was always, where the hell are these people coming from? Sense about them. And, and most famously, after they they, uh, they split up at their peak, they, they took the money that they uh, had made. This, this, they took a million pounds and they took it in cash out the bank and they flew up to the Isle of Jura in the Scottish Hebrides. And then on um, just after midnight on August 23rd, 1994, they went to this deserted uh, boathouse in this remote location and and they just set fire to it. They just burnt the lot and, and they couldn't say why they'd done it. They didn't have a reason. You know, all we can really say is that they, they, they felt a compulsion to do it and that compulsion was, you know, so strong that they acted on it. And this really, when I heard about this, this really sort of st- stuck in my craw as it was because um, I didn't have a philosophy that could contain that act. And yeah, I hadn't really been that interested in the, the KLF as, a, as musically, um, as aware of them, of course, you know, but as I say, I came from more of a, a metal background. Um, but after that, I just, you know, it's when something makes sense. You can, you can read about it, you can understand it, uh, you can file it away, you can forget about it. It's just when it makes no sense, when you just cannot fit it into your worldview that uh you know i can't digest things like that they just stay with me and 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 after 20 years you know the uh i'd spent so long thinking about it and attaching it to to various bits it was it was very evident that there was no point asking bill drummond or jimmy courty uh about it because so many people had and you know nothing helpful had come (laughs) really had come out with all that that um uh, out of those interviews and conversations, it was, it was very evident you needed to sort of take a completely different tack. You need to step back. You needed to look at the influences that were going into their life, and you had to sort of tell a story that really wasn't about the KLF. Um, fortunately, no one's you know returned the book because <laughs> they were hoping for yeah. a proper <laughs> some diehard fans yeah, right. going. Hang on a minute, yeah. yeah. Um, <laughs> You know, it, it, and you know, Jimmy Courtney's hardly mentioned in there. It's it's an outrage. It's you know, really, he's a bad book on you know explaining why why Jimmy Courtney is is great, which you conceivably you might want if you wanted a book about the KLF. But it's at the same time, what story it is was a story that sort of really needed to be told, and it was about a lot of things uh, that 
seemed important and relevant to me at the time that no one was talking about anymore you know that that sort of seemed to fall off the radar and it was it was it felt worth um getting it down just before it was it was a lot of it was forgotten you know that's that's how it that's how it felt at the time and it was a fortunately it was because it was just after kindles had come out amazon kindles and and so anyone could have um uh just write, write a book and you just put it out and it and it seemed to me to sort of make sense that okay no you know no one as i could see was really talking about the klf at the time they seem to be a lot more now which is amazing but uh but the, there's probably I, I figured there's probably a couple of thousand people who might be interested in a book about the klf but they would be quite easy to find online so the the logic of doing it you know spending i think four months writing that book uh and putting it out for about four quid fifty on 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 a, a self-published ebook made a lot of sense because uh, again the financial side of these things is you know someone went out and bought a copy of say my timothy leary book that's brilliant i'd get about 60p but you know i'd get about five times more from a self-published ebook so you could do it for a smaller audience it all seemed to think it all seemed just about worthwhile sort of um sort of doing and uh and so i wrote it and um, i knew full well that i didn't want to write the proper biography it, well it was not a proper music biography at all um and i knew that if i was doing it for a publisher that's what they would want you know they wouldn't you can't really go to a uh, a publisher and say that's a book about this band what's interesting about them is they've been completely forgotten uh not really much about them at all uh it's as much about doctor who and alan moore and robert anton wilson and ken campbell as it is about the klf um you know would you like to publish it <laughs> it's not, not going to work well so i did the book that as it needed to be done and put it out myself uh and it just took off it was just wonderful man it was amazing it was um I've got. I must credit uh, Ben Goldacre, you know the the bad science guy. Sure. Uh, he was. Uh, I put it out November twenty third, and then on Christmas Eve uh, that year, which would be twenty twelve, I think, I just saw a tweet from Ben Goldacre saying, "Oh, this is the best book of the year." You know, blah 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 blah, and I could feel at that point the sort of the cogs behind my life sort of ticking over, shifting something. It was, it was different after that. Um, it was yeah, it's really odd you, i just realized oh oh hang on things are about to change now uh and because you know yeah i think he sold about half a million books you know in publishing he's such a uh, uh, an important fated uh, uh guy and a lovely guy as well so it's, uh, uh he introduced me to, i got in touch and he introduced me to his agent and the difference between having a good agent and an okay agent is pretty much life and death in publishing really um because I, I had an agent for my timothy leary book who was fine i've got nothing nothing against him but uh, the 20th century book for it which i wrote afterwards i'd already done the proposal for and i'd done the first chapter about einstein and this big seventeen thousand word thing and i spent six months doing this proposal and um and i sent it to my agent and then 20 minutes later he emailed back and said uh Oh, I don't think you'll get this away. You haven't got the credibility. And, and he was dead right. So, you know, he was dead right. I didn't have the credibility. Um, same time, he could have read it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, and so, so the moment that, that Ben Goldacre sort of holds me up, you know, all agents and publishers just turn, turn to look at me. At, and at that moment, um, I was ready. You know, I, I was going... I have this proposal here, a book, book about the 20th century, and I want to do it, and we should do this. And and it was, you know, it's um, it's like an animal, you know, like a, you know, it, it, there's no thinking. It's it's an immediate sort of reaction. It's like uh, if a, you know, a mouse runs past a cat, the cat just is still and jumps and, and gets it. The, the cat doesn't think, oh, there's a mouse over there. Oh, hang on. I, I, let me just me work out what I should do here. I should I should think this one through because it's important. You don't see a mouse very often. I've got a chance here. You, you can't think these things. You just have to sort of leap. You know, you just have to sort of sort of do it. And um, and and that's what managed to get me through the uh, uh, through the door. Um, that moment of, of of being held up by Ben Goldacre um, with such a strange book, but because it had started to take off. 
uh, I put one, a few publishers wanted my 20th century book, but one of them said, um, oh, and we will put out the Care Left book as well, because that's a bit of fun, you know. Uh, and I, and they their paperback imprint was called Phoenix. And the notion that um, this book about a burning starts as Kindle and become Phoenix. Yeah, that's very appealed to me massively. Yes. That yeah. was that was really good. So I, I they went and the the Care Left book came out with them, and you know the the difference in a book that's on you know bookshop shelves in in Waterstones or or wherever to one that's just ebook only. It's just you know it's just great, and it's just hasn't really stopped the Care Left book. Uh, it's just every day there's usually someone new sort of finding it, and uh, um, yeah, so. Th- the the um the changes it brought about in my life that, that book you know are just phenomenal phenomenal really are and uh, and, and well yeah and it's, it, it's kind of interesting that there there's definitely a spell involving fire and transmutation there that ends up with the, the agent in the the twentieth century book I was unaware that you had that kind of not ready but you had that idea in your head uh, sort of simultaneously with uh, the klf uh, so how does that because there's a couple of things i want to talk about about the intro to first of all why are you why are you writing about the 20th century and then i want to talk mm. about greenwich because the greenwich stuff was like oh i'm going to enjoy this because um, i've bored people walking around greenwich with the kind of <laughs> implications of its location and, and worldviews and, and reality construction because it's just fascinating. But let let us mm. begin with uh, the sort of genesis of, of the idea of a 20th century book. Um, a lot probably came from that stage towards the end of writing the Timothy Leary book when I started to realise the impact that acid had on the computer industry because I wasn't kind of prepared for that. It just seemed like two separate worlds that I never knew were connected it turned out to be, you know, integrally uh, linked. And, and it's, a, it's a personal discovery too, because that kind of makes you Leary's nephew, uh, because your journey went up through computers and then you end up writing a book about Leary where you find out about LSD and its impact on computers and you get caught in a very acid trip loop. Yeah, um, the, it's, it's it's what we refer to as the ever thickening mythos, which sort of surrounds all these <laughs> these things we're doing. Everybody, that, well, what's great about the um, that distributed uh, network of people who are doing stuff at the moment is that everyone's so different and is coming to it from a completely different angle, uh, and yet all our all our you know our narratives sort of. Uh, complement each other they all sort of feed into each other there's no sort of clashing or or, or competition or, or angst that sort of sort of comes from it these these sort of synchronicity sort of narratives um i'm a, a big big part of, of, of what's happening at the moment and uh yeah fascinating uh but uh so, so your question was so why the 20th century it was it was leery when you realized this is this is an yeah, odd it's thing that happened leery, it was it was partly I saw a Dali exhibition and I was looking at uh, the melting clock. It was a statue of the melting clock, not the, uh, not the painting. And I looked at the date, and it suddenly dawned on me that oh, that was after that was after relativity was was known. You know, there was no history of art is entirely devoid of um, melting clocks until Le- until Einstein uh, says that time is a thing that is can be stretched. It's not a fixed thing. It can be. Uh, it, it can be stretched, and I thought, ah, oh, and that was a real penny dropping. And it's a combination of a lot of those little things that made me think that all these little separate silos of understanding of the of the twentieth century that really they're probably part of a bigger thing, aren't they? They probably all connect in ways that uh, that uh, I haven't sort of grasped yet. And all the books that you'd see about the twentieth, that popular sort of histories of the twentieth century were all written by either politicians uh, or, or political journalists or, or, or very sort of politically active historians like Eric Hobsbawm. And they all took the view that uh, it, was the 20, it was the politicians who made the 20th century. You know, like, you look at the politicians and then that's how you tell that story. And the 20th century, really, really, that ain't enough. <laughs> really, isn't, really isn't enough. You know, when things like, I don't know, uh, nuclear power or the internet things occur 
politicians are just really scrabbling to keep up with what what sort of what sort of going on so the notion that um I didn't quite understand the time that it made me. Uh, and it would probably be useful to have a better grasp on the time that had made me. That was what fed into that book. That was what, what uh, uh, yeah, that was the reason for that one. So presumably you were asked this uh, during the, the writing of it, but what makes the 20th century different from the 19th, for instance? Like why, why, is, why, why did you single out the 2-0 rather than the 1-9 for your book? Yeah, well, it was it was um, as, as as I say in the book, it, it's it's we're pretty uh, okay. We've got our heads round all the great innovations and discoveries of history up until about the end of the nineteenth century. You know, everything before that, electricity, democracy, agriculture, photography. You know, we we get we know what they are. We might not. Um, you know, we might not know how to build a steam engine ourselves, but we have a sense that it probably makes sense and that, you know, we don't have existential horror and fear about it. But as soon as you hit the 20th century, bam, that's when you get Einstein, you get relativity, you get cubism, you get the modernists, you get quantum mechanics, you, you get chaos mathematics, you get postmodernism, you get existentialism, you get all these subjects that are, you're just like, oh, God, they're horrible something horrible about and inhuman and uh, uh, about all those sort of subjects and the um uh, and the temptation is just to because the more you look at them the the harder and more complex they get and the temptation is just to go well maybe i don't need to know about them maybe i can catch up again when things start to make make sense but that does mean that you know you find yourself in the 21st century looking at it with 19th century eyes and going oh this doesn't make a huge amount of sense um i think what the book came about uh or, or what the book generated in me was the realization that all those subjects that by themselves seem terrifying make far more sense when you look at them all together uh, and and that notion which is the reason it started at um at Greenwich, the notion of of, uh, of of the omphalos of the fixed point of the a, a point that's supposed to be the centre of everything, uh, getting rid of that idea is key to pretty much most of those things I was I was talking about. And once you once you've grasped that, the twentieth century slowly starts to sort of fall into place a bit more. I um, hope anyway. It's it's not fighting the acid trip as you come up on it because it's uh the 20th century i think it's a really good way of describing it uh if you just decided to sit it out and and hope it would make sense you are you're looking at it with victorian eyes you're looking at reality yeah. with victorian eyes and and the thing is most people are because it is yeah. you could you, in i could as a you know a country gentleman in the 1880s i could build a camera it's not that difficult. Yeah. I may not know how. I can go to a library or order a book from London and and I can build a camera. I can't build Absolutely. an iPhone. And I also yeah. can't the, the the philosophies were discreet. People still I mean scientists largely because they're hobbled with their own 19th century version of materialism, but scientists can't get quantum mechanics right. So how yeah. is my how is my hairdresser going to get it right? <laughs> I know, and, 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 and you look on at it. It's it's the century that gets away from you ideologically. And what I found interesting, especially when you're talking about the chaos stuff, because uh, once you get to strange attractors and and chaos magic uh, mm. and fractals in the '80s, it's not only um, you'll never understand this. What's built into it is you cannot ever understand it. So it, it's it's a difficult yeah. worldview to grasp that is about the fact yeah. that you can't ever get it. That's its whole point. And uh, and that's just that just seemed like the apotheosis of 20th century mathematics, where you go, well, of course, of course, someone invents a way of thinking about numbers that will be permanently out of my grasp. Yeah, I mean, because I, I come from the computer background and. Um... You know, I had coded my own Mandelbrot set at one point, and the, and the James Gleek book, Chaos, was a, another very important book for me. Um, it was a slow realization that, um, yeah, a lot of people haven't had that. You know, what, what's intuitive and simple to you, you tend to project out, assume that everybody else understands. So when the uh, the banking crisis was happening, and uh, and a lot of the, the climate change denial seems to be based on an inability to 
understand you know these 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 complex non-linear sort of systems um to the extent you just think oh god if only they teach chaos mathematics in secondary school you know it's it's uh it's so important it's such a necessary way of such a necessary tool for uh understanding you know the complexity of of, of, of things uh it's you telling you know teaching people about circles and squares and you know straight lines and and, and things like that isn't teaching them about the world that they have to navigate you know it's it's, it's a lot that we learned in the 20th century uh that's useful man it's really useful it's good stuff and uh, uh and, and not one to be turned away from it's uh i like the interrelations of we, we just kind of mentioned observing uh the the dali clock structure and realizing that was post relativity that's yeah. uh, the 20th century because it did seem to kind of squish in a lot of history into a hundred short years. You know, hundreds of millions of people died. Uh, we invented mm. about three different economic systems, uh, multiple uh, <laughs> political systems, which is sort of really made up for the lost time, which was, oh, well, we had empires for a couple of centuries, and that's not that bad. And then, no, 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 it's not that good. We should hurry and, and, and make loads of them. Uh, you don't get existentialism if you don't realize that it kind of emerged in post-occupied Paris and, and thinking about it, it can only come from the 20th century because they had just seen the end of the kind of uh, fin de siècle in, in totalitarian occupation. So the old ways, uh, old spiritualities and all that kind of stuff don't work, but the, the sort of modern options, which was the Nazi occupation, were also pretty shit. And yeah. uh, that's why you have this weird mix of that kind of nihilism. And uh, and, and I think, it really, I had Gary Luckman on a couple of weeks ago talking about his Colin Wilson book. And I think Colin mm. Wilson's criticism of the existentialists that uh, they were essentially atheists is is not actually and he's correct isn't inherent in existentialism but you can understand it they're not going back to the french catholic church after you know yeah. fighting in the resistance that narrative is broken and, and, and all Absolutely. these pieces that are just so 20th century contextual and it it just seems to have really compressed a lot into uh into a brief hundred years oh i completely agree with everything you just said yes so I was thinking about, uh, I'm very interested, even though it doesn't work, but I, I mean, I'm interested in McKenna's um, time wave zero and I'm interested in, in um, wave theory from economics and all that kind of stuff, because you're, mm -hmm. what you're essentially dealing with, with say Martin Armstrong's wave theories is, or Terence McKenna, is the accumulation of novelty along a timeline. Or it's yeah. or it's uneven distribution uh, because I gave a presentation about it being unevenly distributed rather than accumulating, but there yeah. are points when because it's unevenly distributed there are certainly points where novelty just really really accumulates very very fast so that that velocity um, the graph just goes vertical and uh, and the twentieth yeah. century is is one of those moments now. Bless him, I guess it was a time that he was living in, but for most of McKenna's kind of public speaking career, he was quite, I guess, utopian about yeah. this accumulation of novelty, um, be it through ideology and technology and medical advances and all the other kind of things that we snatched from the really bad stuff that happened in the 20th century. And he was kind of like, you know, it was a bit lyrious. We're all going to kind of, eventually mankind will be a computer program beaming itself through space. Yes. <laughs> uh, I mean, have, have you, how do you feel about you, that? Not not exactly uh, that, but are you? Do you think the accumulation of novelty that is the twentieth century is? Do you lean more towards a utopian twenty second century, or? Uh, I think there's a lot to be said for taking a utopian stance. Um, um, you know, Bob Wilson would always say that the optimistic mind, you know, sees thousands of, of uh, ways to tackle a problem which the pessimistic mind will just give up on straight away. So, you know, from a slightly rational sort of point of view, trying to be a, uh, a utopian is beneficial. Obviously, there's no such thing as utopia or dystopia. There's always this this chaotic, crazy mix of times where some things are good on on some perspectives and other things are bad in other perspectives. You know, there's 
there's not been a time that you know we lived through the you know the the, the black death you know we, we you know we lived through the, the spanish flu the first world war you know the the cold war there's been there's been times of collapsing empires and and plagues and starvations and and you know there's there's not times are never good or bad they're just you, they're just stuff you have to get through <laughs> i'm not explaining this at all well i don't think no I'm not, I, I, you I'm absolutely not expecting are. Yeah. At, at some point in the future people will say right we'll stop now let's take score everything's perfect or everything's yeah. terrible <laughs> always it's always this this sort of insane insane sort of uh uh unfolding narrative that we have to deal with now we have to sort of to get up get our our heads together with now um and i, I think uh so which i'm not again in fact i'm in many ways very pro sort of utopian thinking because it helps in that sort of dealing with now sort of thing i'm, I'm very conscious that at some point in the 80s we sort of gave up on the future this i'm talking mainstream culture here i know there's pockets of you know you know african sci-fi or or, or, or whatever that's that's much more utopian but um in mainstream culture things like the star trek where we go out to the future and it's great you know that those stopped uh and then we got the zombies and the environmental collapses and we get the road and mad max and things like that in fact i think for my for my um from what I can see, the last uh, positive future that made it to the mainstream culture was in Bill and Ted, the first Bill and Ted film, where they go, the future's great. It's really just like now, but the water slides are better. That was the that was the final grasp of you know portraying this wonderful, wonderful sort of future. Um, and e- even then, you know, even in Star Trek, when Star Trek came back in the in the in the nineties. And it starts off all you think, oh, it's Star Trek, it's all utopian, there's no money, everything's great. Uh, they, they were immediately sort of picked up and flung to the other, other side of the universe to, to see the, the Borg. And they learn that um, this is uh, coming for them and there's nothing they can do about it. Uh, and they, they are not capable of, you know, they're not up to the task of going exploring the universe at all as, as you know, they, the, the ones in the 60s were. Suddenly we, we, we're in this time um of no positive visions of the future at all in our culture and if it's true that uh, you know if to create the future you you first have to have to to imagine it um then that's that's very worrying to me that's very worrying to me so i'm all where i'm coming with this is i'm all for the utopianism of of, of mckenna and leary and robert anton wilson even if you know i don't think when they you know project out their time wise or they or they uh, assume everything will be be wonderful. I don't. I don't think they're right. You know, Leary and Wilson, um, in particular, uh, had no environmental concern. They just they dismissed it as Boy Scouts needing to tidy up the planet. The story was about going on to the um, to the stars and becoming and sort of these immortal godlike beings. Which, funnily enough, have you read um, uh, Homer Deus by? Um, Oh, what's his name? Uh, Yuval Noah Harari, the guy who wrote *Sapiens*. No, I haven't. Um, I know the book it's, you mean, but yeah, it's really, it's really interesting. I, lo- I liked it a lot. It's um, uh, what's what's amazing about it is he's basically saying what Leary was saying, right? That we're all going to become these immortal um, uh, into into dimen- into uh, galactic traveling uh, creatures. Uh, but he's saying it from a position of, of great credibility and authority, you know, after writing Sapiens, after after his academic career. Yeah, uh, I, he's just saying exactly the same thing. It's very, very weird. It, well, it's it's not. It's just not an interesting version of it. So um, Kurtzweil, I think, is is a psychopath. I think this kind of materialism and and desperate fear of death is is re- is highly dysfunctional. So you you had the the people who essentially had the same idea but a nicer version of it, which is Bob Wilson and Leary, and to some extent uh-huh. McKenna, going, we're going to end up uh, as as software traveling the universe. That's kind of it. Um, Kurzweil is like yeah. the, the evil, hideous version of that—the one who hasn't clearly taken the uh, the, the psychedelics and, and <laughs> experienced a kind of nicer, more animate universe. Because his is yeah. this horrific fear-based thing where he and his billionaires are going to try and 
build um a, a, yeah a piece of software that approximates their consciousness and fucking beam it to Elon Musk's Mars colony and live there while we all <laughs> die of whatever climate collapse we end up with. You know, this is awful. That's actually, and I think yeah. this is um kind of when you said you weren't explaining it correctly. Uh, the, the difference in, in attitude and timeline. The, my refrain pretty much since um, early June, well, since Brexit, is this is just our mm-hmm. point in the timeline. This is what it is. Yeah. Uh, and yeah. I, I think I think the zombie films and, and all that kind of stuff is the unconscious expressing the... And I'm very grateful for the death of neoliberalism. We, these are the things that neither... Uh, well, McKenna and, and um, Bob Wilson didn't really look at the the kind of bodies you have to throw into the furnace to keep neoliberalism and and that kind of utopian future western utopian future going and i think we're mm. seeing the consequences of that um fail globally and that's good like it's crap to be living through it this is our point in the timeline but it's actually good mm. that that extractive model has reached its high watermark and is receding. So after the zombies comes the utopian space operas again uh, is is what I hope. So we stick around to 2022 and there'll be some really cool space operas. This is this is my prediction. Yeah, I think so. I mean, uh, I, I, love, I mean if you're talking about Kurzweil and the, the singularity and stuff like that, a lot of that is sort of uh projecting forward a linear line, you know, which is uh to to absurdity almost and um that's not how that's not how things work you know just if you look at the uh, the limit of the speed of light it goes faster and faster and faster but that creates this 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 well drags not the, the good word but it, it doesn't go on forever you know it's a, the the projecting lines linearly forward uh into the future that's that's just misunderstanding uh, well, <laughs> how things well, are. So I don't. It's I don't... a systemic misunderstanding because mm-hmm. he thinks he's solved consciousness as well, so that he can actually fucking map it. So he's like his first principles are completely unscientific, which is that mm-hmm. the brain produces consciousness. So I just need to have a computer. Everyone at every level of technology, going back to the ancient Greeks, building automata, thought that you could. You could increase the technic- technological complexity sufficiently to be a, a reasonable proxy of of something organic, and uh, that bit is wrong. And then you're pointing it in the line. Well, that's actually why I asked if you're a utopian because here's what I think. Well, here's an interesting point in the timeline way of looking at it, and where I mean, I adore um, Terence McKenna's stuff, uh, however flawed he was as well, but. So I live in Australia, and and uh, my first book was about sort of Paleolithic cultures, and and the longest continually practiced, the oldest continually practiced cultures on Earth are Australian Aboriginal cultures, forty uh-huh. to fifty thousand years, uninterrupted until uh, something happened two hundred and twenty years ago, give or take. Uh, yeah. So that is so it's fifty thousand year old culture. I would kind of define you, you can take your pick but let's say northwestern european culture began with gutenberg so they've been around for 50 times 50 gutenbergs is how long they've been around yeah. okay. uh, where yeah. so where 150th on 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 wherever this road wherever this like accumulation of technological novelty road leads we're only 150th of the way, and that means there are 49 more Gutenbergs in which we can destroy ourselves and collapse, and they'll still be there. And that's the bit that right. I have a problem with with Terence. He's like, oh, we're all going to head into the future. I'm like, no, no, your data set is too small. If you, if you take yeah. the data set back to ancient Greece, that's still only two Gutenbergs. That you still got to survive 25 lengths back to ancient Greece through... Um, ice age is coming and going and invasions and everything else we're not quite like this is an eye blink what we're doing and it might it may not yeah it may not have a fifty thousand year point and then you have to ask yourself rationally if the, well, um if you do tally up from the clouds well which culture was the one that was the most advanced or worked the best it's probably the one that lived probably the one that actually made it to the finish line and i think that's really interesting <laughs> about about thinking about the 20th century because it is just this um just boom of of everything and it it's we're still sort of feeling that velocity of it now but it's also right. it's also only 100 years and and there are people who've been playing for 50,000 maybe <laughs> maybe on the, on the balance of it 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 will look 
uh, it, it won't look that great in 2000 years time. Who knows? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and I do. I mean, the the uh, the view of it that writing the book gave me was that it. Although initially, I thought this huge growth of individualism was, you know, it's many see as you know the, the, the ultimate crowning uh, uh, way of understanding ourselves. Uh, writing the book taught me that no, that was ju- that was just the, the, this this period between when the old rules went away and before the new world the rules sort of came in. There was just this 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 period of chaos where we were just scrambling around trying to make sense of something. So there's this, this sense of it is this sort of liminal. I, I sort of try and avoid that. I'm writing a book about, um, about Britain, which is out next July. And one of my things was I must never use the word liminal. Right? <laughs> oh, thank it's you. It's obviously psychogeographic, but you know, I've got to do something different for God's sake with it. I can't use the word, <laughs> just rely on things like that. But the 20th century was this sort of liminal um, uh, uh, breath between uh two different ways of of organizing and understanding ourselves and uh, and because of that it was you know terrifying and and violent and and scary and uh, but like undeniably thrilling oh, you know? it's it was it will be the stag weekend in vegas of centuries of, of the <laughs> west like you get back and go whoa yeah. <laughs> a lot of that shouldn't have happened uh some of it was yeah. great burn the photos you know <laughs> what stays in the 20th century stays Pretty in the 20th century. <laughs> oh fascinating I, I agree with what you say about a liminal uh, i was listening to a james altucher podcast the other week and he was interviewing mm. another writer and uh he said i don't use the word interesting anymore uh i either say uh-huh. thought provoking or not because everything is interesting and if yeah. you only use thought provoking if Someone had said something that provokes a thought, so that I'm going to like, I'm going to ban liminal. I, I'm allergic to that word anyway. But the other one is yeah. replace interesting with thought provoking, or don't use it. Yeah, yeah. It's uh, uh, just watching Captain Fantastic the other night. It's a, a similar uh, discussion in there between a father and a daughter. Daughter uses the word interesting, and uh, Vigo Mortensen just like. Well, anyway, that's beside the by, but it's a great film. Captain Fantastic, really nice. recommend it. Well, Mr. Higgs, this has been a very thought-provoking uh, conversation. So uh, for people who would like to know more, where would they go to find out? Obviously, all the books and, and, and the um, the Twitter handles and things will be in the show notes, but just tell the people who are listening and driving well, right now. Oh, uh, well, uh, t- you can just Google me, John Higgs, and I will I will turn up, but you'll probably find my the books that will probably jump out of the KLF and uh, stranger than we can imagine making sense of the 20th century. Uh, and I would heartily recommend anyone to try either of those. Yes, that's seconded. Well, once again, thank you very much. Thanks, Gordon. So year two is off to a good start. Tim Leary, Bob Wilson, Alan Moore, Terence McKenna, The Shitness of Ray Kurzweil, The Writing Life, and The Crazy, Crazy 20th Century. If these are a few of your favourite things, be sure to subscribe to the show in iTunes, your favourite podcatcher, or on YouTube. Visit runesoup.com or the RuneSoup Facebook page and let me know what you think. Also, find me on Twitter where I am Gordon, G-O-R-D-O-N, underscore white, W-H-I-T-E. Until next time.